Okay, time for another Will Radio. I think it's part eight. I'm not sure. I've kind of lost count. Okay, they'll start a timer. I've got 20 minutes, and then this is going to be done. I didn't even know there was a clock app for Mac OS. There is, and you can set timers. There's a world clock and all sorts of stuff. All right, here we go. So I finished my uh, setup for my nerd typing. Made a video about that and uploaded it today. Uh, I guess, you know, the keyboard is pretty cool. The Kinesis Advantage 360. It's pretty cool with the new keycaps and everything and the the wrist guards. Um, I'm getting used to it. I'm still slow, but I'm starting to get used to it. Getting used to the arrow keys less quickly. Uh, Dvorak layout seems very cool. I wish I had tried this before. Um, my fingers move much less. And I'm starting to get a sense of where the finger, where like the the keys are. Uh, I think I'm starting to learn it. I think my RSI seems slightly improved, although I have noticed that my wrist pain uh, seems going away and I'm starting to get some elbow pain, but that also may have been from typing a letter um, kind of in a non-ergonomic position. I tried switching to par edit. I tried switching tonight. I've tried one time before and I gave up uh, years ago. And tonight I tried, I thought, okay, well, if I'm switching to Dvorak and I've got this weird keyboard and I have to relearn how to type anyway, let's just switch the par edit and try it and commit to that. <clears throat> so I made a video um, and I installed par edit and I updated my Dottie Max file and all that stuff. And I immediately ran into a problem, which was when I was starting Shea Scheme and trying to evaluate an expression, I would try to evaluate expression like five at the REPL. I'd hit uh, return or enter, and then it would just do a new line, but nothing would happen. Shea wouldn't respond. And I tried removing everything from my .emacs file. I tried a whole bunch of different ways. I tried updating to latest Emacs. I tried downgrading from par edit 26 to 25. Nothing I, I did work. Now, I know people who use par edit, so I know that it's possible. But as part of this process... You know, I started looking at the different versions of par edit and I started looking at the the logs and the, the messages and you know, par edit's on version 26. And the the messages have to do with, you know, fixed bugs, uh, version 25 fixed bugs, version 24 fixed bugs, whatever. Um well, I'm glad that par edit exists. I'm glad that the bugs are being fixed and people are still playing around with the functionality. Um, but once I started looking into that, I quickly came to the conclusion that, you know, <clears throat> par edit isn't for me. Even if I could get it to work at the REPL, I just don't trust that level of complexity. Like par edit basically rebinds all these keys, you know, so... You know, control J is rebound and return is rebound and they all do kind of funky things, uh, all of which I'm sure are useful in some sense. But the fact that there are 26 versions of par edit and there are bugs that are being fixed in these different versions, like, okay, that's way, way, way too complicated for me. I have a system based on what Adul Aziz Gulom set me up with uh, based on his system about 20 years ago. I don't think I've ever found a bug in it. It's very small. It's very minimal. It doesn't have problems with interacting with other modes in general. I know the failure failure points if I'm going to do something uh, fancy. And uh, it's, it's like very, very minimal. It, it you know just doesn't get in my way generally. So uh, par edit just seems like too much. And, and at first, my first response to par edit was the commands were too much. Like I would have to learn too much. But that's not really it. It's, it's like a philosophical thing that I don't want all the fancy features. I want 
just a couple things. So, you know, if I were to make a change, what I would consider doing would be modifying the balanced paren mode and, you know, sort of the scheme setup I have to add slurp and bar for one of the useful commands from, from par edit. But in general, that's just not the philosophy I have. I like really small things. So like this is one reason I like Shea scheme. Shea scheme is quite minimum. You know, Racket has the philosophy of being a batteries included scheme, um, which I appreciate. And and par edit is sort of like the batteries included version of the really stripped down version I have for scheme. And I can appreciate that and I know exactly why people use it and why they find it handy and there are times where I find that handy. Philosophically though, I'm much more the the non-batteries included tiny minimum version where everything works. I know all the failure modes, I know how to avoid them. You know, that kind of thing, that's it. And I just want it to be super reliable. That's like the main thing. I don't ever want to encounter a bug. I don't ever want to be giving a demo or a talk where, you know, I encounter some sort of weird corner case and just something doesn't work. You know, that's that's my philosophy. So not for me. <clears throat> that's fine. I'm glad I, I tried it, but I, I just threw the video away. I just got frustrated with it. <clears throat> All right. Um, that also just explains a lot. Like, why do I use Scheme? Why do I use Shea Scheme? Why don't I use like Haskell? You know, Haskell's way too complicated for me. GHC is way too complicated. It's not that I don't think it's cool. It's not that I don't think it has cool ideas. I'm very glad it exists. I'm glad people are exploring um, the ideas in Racket, but, you know, not for me, for something for me to explore my own ideas. Okay, uh, rethinking approach uh, to books. So I've got my typing set up now. I'm slow. Um, I'm slow enough that it does, you know, kind of still affect how I think about approaching something like writing a book. And I'm thinking, yeah, maybe I need to spend time, you know, practicing typing each day. I don't know. Um, but <clears throat> in the time it took me to get my keyboard setup and the keycaps and all the other things. I've read a number of books by Dean Wesley Smith on writing novels quickly. And I looked at the MIT instruction, MIT press instructions to authors. And I uh, ordered the two books that are recommended there. And I've been looking at those books. Uh, the first book, I don't know, I've got it around here somewhere. It's like, Think like an editor. Yeah, here it here it is. Thinking thinking like your editor. How to get how to write great serious nonfiction and get it published by Susan Rabiner and Alfred Fortunato. Okay, and then the other one is. Getting It Published, A Guide for Scholars and Anyone Else Serious About Serious Books, third edition by William Germano. So these are both recommended by um, MIT Press <clears throat> if you're going to approach them with a publishing project. Uh, <clears throat> you know, the Thinking Like Your Editor book, I think it has a useful perspective as to what an editor, especially from a commercial publishing house, is looking for. Uh, it also kind of turned me off in, in the same way that once I started doing online uh, uncourses and things like that, my tolerance for what I see as problems in a standard classroom and standard course setting, you know, uh, my tolerance for that stuff decreased where it's like, you know, if I'm doing an uncourse online, the people coming to it are interested in the topic and there's not a grade and there's not, you know, <clears throat> there's not arguments over grades and there's not distractions about that. And uh, you know, there's just like a totally different mindset. And I was reminded of this when reading this book about uh, thinking like your editors, like, okay, I understand why the editors in the commercial publishing houses think this way, 
Um, but you know, in the world where you can self-publish, I'm not sure I want to play that game. So uh, it was a little, <clears throat> I guess I was a little turned off by the fact that MIT Press says these are the books to read um, if you want to do a project with them. But of course, I, I have two editions of a book with MIT Press, but that was through Dan, who's gotten lots of books published with them. And I think it has changed over time, kind of how they, they do things. Um, the other book, Getting It Published, well, this book I think is useful still. I mean, I, I think both books are useful, but, you know, the first book made me think, maybe self-publish. Uh, for the second one, you know, it talks about dealing with uh, rights for quotations and long excerpts, and if you want to publish a poem or a, a photograph or painting, you know, like dealing with that stuff. So there's like a lot of mechanical things that I think are interested in, in interesting in that book. You know, both books are, I think, have things in them that are worthwhile, but it also makes me think, yeah, you know, what I'm trying to communicate with, say, like the, the most beautiful program ever written, what I'm trying to communicate may just not align that well with, you know, what a commercial publishing house wants. Now, a place like MIT Press, maybe it's fine. You know, maybe even O'Reilly or Manning. Um, but I'm not sure. You know, I'm also, I could totally just self-publish. And also, you know, whatever I'm going to do is going to be under some sort of Creative Commons license. So people can always just download it. So, uh, but, but the other part is, you know, how many books I'm going to write, how quickly, what exactly are the books. I've also been rethinking that. So, you know, I committed to doing 11 books this year at a certain rate. Um, as soon as my RSI started, <laughs> you know, hitting me, it was like, okay, I, I maybe need to, to uh, take a little break and think about this. Um, you know, what I really want to do with both these videos and the writing and everything else I'm trying to tie in with the videos is get myself unstuck. You know, like Minsky said, intelligent behavior is the ability to get yourself unstuck. I keep saying that there are things that are important to me. I want to spend my time and attention on, and I'm not doing those. I'm not spending my time and attention on those. So I'm trying to align what I spend my time and attention on to be much closer um, to what I, what I claim is important to me. Um, so that's the real thing. And whether or not I publish 11 books this year or one book or two, you know, that doesn't matter. What matters to me is getting unstuck and making progress where I can get a book out the door. I can finish a book. Um, now I do want to be faster because I, I think there's no reason for me to be as slow as I am. Um, but I think a lot of it is just like like uh, Dean Wesley Smith says, being a fast writer doesn't mean you type quickly. It means that you spend more time, uh, you know, sitting in the chair typing each day um, than someone else. So, you know, my average amount of time working on a book uh, in the last year, you know, probably a couple minutes a day. So I want to improve that. And of course, I didn't finish any of those books. Speaking of things I want to make progress on, um, actually, before I started making these videos, what I was going to do, okay, <laughs> going back, originally I was going to write some books. I was going to write some books with a friend, maybe, or just by myself, and I talked to one of my friends. And then it's like, well, I don't know, books are a big thing, and I got uh, sort of chicken. So I like, well, how about a podcast? I want to do something creative. So I have this idea for a podcast called your eyes shine when, or it's a podcast not about technical things necessarily, it could be about whatever, but about what people I know, like what you know, sort of fills them with joy and enthusiasm. What are the things that they really love that maybe other people don't know about? And, you know, just sharing that passion and excitement and deep interest, like like me talking about Kyushu Jungara Ramen and Akihabara or whatever else I, I really am into. Um, now some of those are technical, like scheme, you know, um, but, you know, trying to talk about things that aren't just technical things. Uh, and, and I tried, uh, recording an episode with a friend and the, 
you know, I basically didn't figure out how to do the audio and uh, didn't, you know, didn't come out. And I haven't done another one since, but I got an email, email from the friend today who I was talking to about writing a book with. And uh, she suggested, or she was saying, hey, you know, where's your podcast? I want to watch it. You know, just giving me encouragement, which I really appreciate. So I want to get back on the podcast. The Will Radios are fun, but those are like solo podcasts. I want to do something with someone else. I actually am you know, paying each month for some sort of podcasting service. I forget the name of it, Sprout Hub or something. Um, <clears throat> but I haven't haven't made any podcasts yet. So, you know, once again, there's like this audio thing that I really got tripped up with. Audio, I have so much respect for all the problems that audio can can, uh, can cause. So I was spending part of today reading about how to deal with that. Um, so yeah, I want to, I want to do some epis of, um, you know, your eyes shine when, uh, part of it's also trying to get some friends to talk about things. Uh, you know, that's not a solo podcast. I I guess I could do a couple epis by myself just to kind of set the stage. Maybe I'll do that. That way I don't have any excuse. Um, and then, you know, I got to figure out the RSS and the distribution and all that. I mean, I could just do the podcast on on YouTube. I could do it that way, but I'd like to learn how to do a podcast using the other infrastructure. Uh, and I, I would like to start tying in some of the biomedical and precision medicine work into, uh, you know, the videos and, you know, whatever. <laughs> the, the things I'm doing, right? Because that is uh, my day job. And also I think we're doing some interesting work. So um, that's, that's a little too close in some sense. It feels a little too close to what I'm doing uh, day to day. So um, I've kind of avoided that, but you know, I want to get into it at least to some extent. And then um, what I call the big game uh, that's the only term I've, I've only used it with it myself internally, but, uh, aging interventions is something I've been interested in for 30 years or more. So like, let's see, when I started at college at Chicago in 1989, I started reading about molecular biology and I realized, oh, in 30 years or so, it's likely we're going to start having technology or it might be possible to make some sort of intervention on aging, slow it down, or even reverse in some or more than some ways. Um, I remember telling my roommate this uh, in 1989, and he thought I was insane. I mean, he thought that uh, I needed psychiatric help and maybe to spend some time in an institution for even bringing it up. And so I just didn't mention it to anyone for a long time afterwards and things have changed. So, you know, it's not, um, you know, the cover of time magazine is like, you know, this child or child will live to be 150. or you know, like now it's no longer considered this absolutely ridiculous idea. And with things like CRISPR and, you know, other technologies coming on now, we have like RNA vaccines and, you know, we have uh, cryo EM and we can, um, predict protein folding to some extent, and we've got all the AI advancements. So I'm starting to get into that. That was actually one of the big reasons I wanted to get into the biomedical stuff and the in bio and so forth. So starting to dip my, my toes into this. Um, but you know, that's uh, something I'm very interested in. And so maybe talk about that a little bit. I mean, I'm not an expert in this area by any, by any means, but you know, that does tie into the biomedical and precision medicine things and computational medicine. And, uh, and I, I know people, I'm starting to work with people who are, uh, experts in that area. So that's very interesting and exciting to me. I think there's a lot of work to be done there, but starting, starting to, I mean, if nothing else, at least starting to get, um, realization from people that, Hey, you know, this, this might not be ridiculous. Uh, probably can do some things, at least, uh, you know, mid medium term. Okay, well, I've got 15 seconds left to go, 
And uh, I've got a, I guess I've got a got podcast to start thinking about. I'll talk to you all soon. Have a good one. Bye-bye.